What the hell is up, you guys? My name is Jamie Logan, and today I have a super, super special guest for you. I interviewed Sharon Gannon. She's an animal rights activist, an artist, author, poet, dancer, musician, and she is the co-founder of Jiva Mukti Yoga, which is what I practice. I mean, she's really a renaissance woman when you think about it. So you can imagine how hard it is to fit everything into a one hour interview. But I wanted to give you a little background before we start on Sharon. She was born in Washington, DC. She studied dance at the University of Washington, became an animal rights activist in 1982 after seeing a film called The Animals Film. She moved to New York, began working at Life Cafe, which is where she met her partner, David. She began practicing yoga because a friend recommended it because she had a back injury and her friend told her it might help her out. And it did. In 1984, after a four month trip to India, her and David opened up the first Jiva Mukti yoga studio in New York City and it blew up quickly. Celebrities like Madonna, Sting were there. I mean, it was like the coolest spot to be and other studios were like, how are you guys doing this? What's your marketing tactic? And the coolest part about this is that the core foundation of Jiva Mukti yoga is veganism. So today, Sharon and I are gonna talk about the yogic principles and how they are directly correlated with veganism and animal rights. It was an absolute honor to speak with Sharon. She is an icon, a legend. She's very humble. I know she doesn't want me saying this, but I'm, I'm really just so grateful. And I feel like I've known this woman forever. I mean, maybe I have, could be a past life thing. If you know, you know. Without further ado, guys, enjoy the episode. Jiva Mukti Yoga was a way that I felt that I could be a better activist. It gave me a platform where I could speak about these things in a different way than how yoga was being presented, certainly in America. I started to see things in the yoga scriptures that could be applied to veganism. Yoga teaches that the happiest person is the one who brings happiness to others. That would imply or infer that killing others, eating them, abusing them is not going to suit our purposes. And so when people do look more deeply into yoga, then they can see that it's not just about a workout, unless they want it to be just about a workout. That veganism is not just about health, unless they want it to be just about health, but it could be so much more. What the hell is up, you guys? My name is Jamie Logan, and today I am here with Sharon Gannon. She is the founder of Jiva Mukti Yoga School. She is a huge inspiration to me, and I am so excited to be here. So thank you for having me in your house and doing this interview. I am honored that you're in my house. This is going to be fun. Yes, very exciting, guys. Today we're going to be talking about yoga. We're going to be talking about veganism. You might learn a thing or two about how to improve your daily habits, how to build a stronger foundation to be an advocate for the animals. And we're here with um, with Sharon, who is the the OG of this, if you will. <laughs> and so, yeah. So, Sharon, why don't you just introduce yourself for some people that may not know you and what you do? Hello, I'm Sharon Gannon, and I am a um, animal rights activist and lover of God and um, try to be a good person. So beautiful, yes. And you've done so much throughout your life where you were an animal rights activist and you started Jiva Mukti Yoga. So can you take us back to when you even found veganism? I was a uh, spiritual practitioner first. Since I was very young, a little girl, I wanted to know God as my friend. Mm. And so I sought out various ways that could help me with that. And I primarily, when I became a young person, like uh, in my 20s, I was an artist, very active in Seattle where I lived. I was a musician and a painter and a dancer. I um, graduated from the University of Washington with a dance degree and um, very soon formed my own dance company. I was a poet, a writer, so I was very active in the arts. And 1982, something happened that 
changed my life forever. And that was that I went to see a movie. And the title of that movie was The Animal's Film. And it was a documentary movie. And it was really the first feature-length documentary movie of its kind Mm -hmm. that showed how non-human animals are treated by human animals Mm -hmm. in food production, laboratory testing, entertainment, all of the things that PETA stands for to try to annihilate. I also stand for that. Animals are not ours to use or abuse in any way. And so this film was a British film, and it showed how we are abusing animals in those horrible, horrible ways. And, of course, me, like most people, we kind of knew that it was not so good. I was a vegetarian at the time, Mm. but I never had seen the inside story. And so that film, after, and I only went to the film because I saw that the soundtrack was by a musician and a composer that I admired, Robert Wyatt, and, but the film just knocked my whole world Mm. around a few times. And after that, I decided I have to do something to stop that Mm. and there was I didn't know any other vegans I mean I was the only vegetarian (laughs) in my group of friends and this was before PETA what do I do you know and I was a deeply into spirituality and had been a librarian at a spiritual library and so I had read yoga scriptures and was studying them at the time and eventually, not it didn't take a long time, but I started to see things in the yoga scriptures mm-hmm. that could be applied. Mm-hmm. And asana was kind of the first revelation. You know, I got up in the morning and I had read this sutra from Patanjali's Yoga Sutra. Stira Sukham Asanam. And it's the first time he talks about asana. And the Sanskrit, all the translations that I found, your posture, they said, should be uh, steady and comfortable. Mm. Somehow, it didn't satisfy me. That's what it's about? Mm. What do these words actually mean? You know, they're written in Sanskrit. What do they actually mean? So I started to probe. Asana means seat in English. Okay, well, what does a seat mean in English? What is a seat? Mm. What does a seat do? What's its function? It holds us. It holds us? Mm -hmm. Cradles our bums. What else? Um, Support. Support. It grounds us to the earth. It grounds us? How does it ground us to the earth? Because it's the connection between the ground and us. It's the connection. Mm. It connects us to the earth. You got it. Ding, ding, ding. (laughs) And so, okay, connection to the earth. What's earth? Is it just dirt, you know, outside? What is it? What is earth? What do we mean by earth? Mm. These are deep questions. I don't know. Yeah. Mother Earth. Mother Earth. Planet. Planet. But is it separate from home? Us? Mm. See, Mm. what is Earth made of? Living beings. Ah. Living beings. Like, of what kind, sort? Animals. Animals. Microorganisms. Microorganisms. Water. Trees. Water. Land. Land. All living beings. How about oh. that? 
All living beings. <laughs> <laughs> I saw where you were going there. <laughs> so, okay, our connection, and a connection implies a relationship. Mm -hmm. So, our relationship to all beings, Patanjali says in the Yoga Sutra, stira sukham, should be steady and comfortable. Mm. So, to me, it was like, I don't know, have you ever like, you know, woke up in the morning and it's like, you get a message, it's like technicolor or it's lit up and you just read it and you see it, it's like, I, I that hasn't happened to me yet. I hope it does one day. <laughs> it can be a blessing and a curse. So it does happen to me. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, it's like, that's what I saw. I saw stira means steady. What does steady mean? Mm -hmm. It means consistent. Comfortable means comfortable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're at mm -hmm. ease, right? Well, for a relationship, mm -hmm. an asana, a connection to the earth, a relationship to the earth and all mm -hmm. beings, to be steady and comfortable that means it's got to be a mutually beneficial relationship. Because mm -hmm. if a relationship is not mutually beneficial, mm -hmm. it's not comfortable for both parties. Right? right? So this is how you sort of started finding your way into the yogic principles and yes. how it finally helped you understand your thought process and the way that you saw the world. Well, because most people think of yoga as the postures or the mm. poses. I hate that uh, term to describe asana. Asana to me means the practice where you purify your relationship to others. And, and that is done by, mm, there are many uh, ways to do it, but putting yourself in these compromising positions, we mm. could say, and breathing, and we get in touch with our past karmas. Mm. They activate the chakras, and they allow us, that experience allows us to actually assess how we have been treating others. Because it's all in our bodies. Right. Our bodies are made of our karmas. Mm. Our karma, karma, we shouldn't get... Um, uh, worried about that word. It is a Sanskrit word, but it just means action. Oh. So how we treat others determines how others treat us. How others treat us determine how we see ourselves, and how we see ourselves determine ultimately who we are. Mm. So every we're so interconnected with everyone that every act of cruelty, Every act of kindness determines who we are mm -hmm. and what our future is. Wow. And so that's a way, the practice of understanding that and experiencing that and trying to resolve <laughs> all the bad stuff or all the, you know, all the confusion within our bodies can lead us to a, uh, an experience that we begin to understand who we really are. And who we really are, according to yoga, is Satchit Ananda. Truth, existence, and bliss. Mostly bliss. Mm, our true nature. Our true nature is happiness. Mm. So how do we become happy? Yoga teaches that the happiest person is the one who brings happiness to others. Mm, so has a good relationship with others. Yeah. So that would imply or infer that killing others, eating them, abusing them, lying to them, stealing from them, is not going to suit uh, our purposes if we want to be happy mm -hmm. and realize that happiness is our true nature. So Jiva Mukti Yoga was a way that... Um, I felt that I could be a better activist. It gave mm. me a platform where I could speak about these things and in a different way than what than how yoga was being presented, certainly in America. 
and in New York City. Um, so a few years went by, and a publisher came to me and said, we want to publish a book about yoga and vegetarianism or veganism. We know you're a vegan, and uh, you're the one to write this book. And I'm like, oh my God, I looked at my schedule. I was like, <laughs> I was like well, what's, when are you thinking about doing this? Well, we need the manuscript by December, at the end of December. What is it now? It's September. I have, like, what are you talking Ooh, about? Um, I have to go to China. I have to travel to, you know, Europe. I have to teach this. I'm an administrator of a school. It's not possible. I can't. Um, I can't. You have to give me more time. Uh, or get someone else. I said, well, actually, I declined. I said no. And then... He was very persistent. And um, so finally, I had a window of time, six days, right? Be, uh, like during Christmas time. And I wrote the book in six days. And I, uh, <laughs> well, you know, I mean, go to sleep, wake up, and you know, I get the message and I write it down. Yeah. I mean, uh, whatever. Wow. I mean, I don't know. That's but, so um, cool. So, I mean, it's so true that sometimes when you let your mind become quiet or silent and you get these messages to you, that's amazing that then you wrote this book. Sleep is really magical. Yeah. I, I need to get totally, more sleep. <laughs> totally uh, not given <laughs> the credit that it deserves for creative thought, I think. Yeah. I, mm -hmm. I think nowadays we're in a world where there's so many distractions that sometimes when you first wake up, you just reach for your phone. Sometimes before, right before you go into bed, you just reach for your phone. You're in an elevator with strangers, you reach for your phone, or you have a lot of different things going on that the, the ability to connect with that inner thought is more difficult in a world of distractions. I think you can be a better activist if you first pull in and then whew, you can go out. Mm-hmm. I consider myself a, a spiritual activist, mm -hmm. meaning that I don't want to just express myself. That's boring. It must be, it's boring for me. It must be boring for others. So why, why would I want to do that? So I want to tap into something deeper mm -hmm. than my personality self. Mm -hmm. Yoga provides ways to do that. Sleep provides ways to do that. Definitely. You know, in deep sleep, there's no REM. There's no dreams. You're, pardon the cliche, but one with the source. Mm. And so from that source, you can go out in a better way. It's been my experience anyway. So what was your experience then after writing this book? I didn't know that when he asked me, when I started to, uh, when I said yes and started to write it, that I would um, follow the outline from Patanjali's Yoga Sutra, uh, the five yamas, mm. uh, which is what you said, the five basic principles. Well, there are many b basic principles in the Yoga Sutra, so those are just five of them. Uh, but they deal, those five, called the yamas. Yama means a restriction, a restriction in the sense of how do you interact with others? Mm. Like, how do you restrict your behavior? How do you direct your behavior? What do you do when you encounter others? Mm -hmm. Because the yoga philosophy kind of begins with the principle, there are no others. You are so apart. Like, you are me and I am you. Mm -hmm. And we are this thing Connected. together. Yeah, yeah, we are this thing together. And that if we don't know that, if... I see you and I don't see God or I don't see my true self. Mm. I see another person who's separate from me or I see a cow yeah. and I see, I don't see myself. I see, and I don't see God. Then I'm far away from the aim of life, mm. which is Satchitananda or ultimate happiness or knowing God or enlightenment, whatever mm -hmm. way you want to describe it. So how do I get there? What's in my way? Well, yoga tells us that others are in our way of happiness. Mm. <laughs> and we don't need yoga to tell us that. Mm. I mean, <laughs> mm. people complain about others all the time, right? Mm. You know, I can't be happy because my boss is, I can't be happy because my boyfriend, I can't be happy because my girlfriend, I can't yeah. be happy because my mom, you know, 
on and on and on. Okay, well, what's the solution? How can we get rid of others then who are in our way? And in the, uh, you know, I think a brilliant movie, but an old movie now, The Matrix, Neo, <laughs> Neo tries to get rid of Mr. Smith by killing him, right? But then there's a point in the movie where they're having a shootout, and this is the most incredible yogic part of the movie, where they're on the ground and they're staring at each other, and they both have guns, and one of them pulls the trigger, says, I'm empty. And the other one pulls the trigger, I'm empty, too. So emptiness, in Sanskrit, it's called shunyata. And it means that there are no others. That if I see something that looks like another person, I'm deciding that it's another person. I'm deciding that it's separate from me. So it's the projections of my mind that determine reality. But what determines the projections of my mind, my thoughts? Where do my thoughts come from? My thoughts come from every interaction that I have had with so-called others in my past. That's what makes up our thoughts. So if we want to see the truth, see reality, experience the happiness of reality, see God, then killing others getting, is not the way to get rid of others. It's seeing them as they really are. And that can be really painful. You know, when you unveil and see the truth, it's like the movie The Matrix. When you leave this world of, you know, everybody just believes a certain way of living and then you go into The Matrix and you're like, wait, this is actually the truth. And it's not, uh, it's like ignorance is bliss. And how do you feel about that? Like now that you've, you know, been exposed to the truth and allowed yourself to see the truth. I wouldn't go so far as to say I've experienced the ultimate truth. I'm working on it too, you know, Jamie. (laughs) I'm like, she's an enlightened being. I'm working on it too, you know, we all are in, in our own unique ways. Yoga tells us, or Patanjali specifically, who was this great guy who lived thousands of years ago, who left us this book. It's a manual of, you know, it's a self help manual, basically. Said, If you're seeing others, if you're still seeing others, that means you're not enlightened. So how should you interact with them? Well, don't hurt them is number one. And that's called ahimsa. So how does that apply? So what I did was I took it further and I saw how each one of these five principles could be applied to veganism. Mm. So uh, ahimsa, don't hurt others. Well... Eating animals hurts others. It's a mean thing to do. I mean, when someone asks me, why are you a vegan? I said, because I don't want to be a mean person. Mm -hmm. Uh, Eating meat, eating dairy products, that's a mean thing to do. I don't want to do that. Who wants to be mean? You can can help it. Come on. And everyone everyone can help. (laughs) Everyone can stop being mean if they they want to. Mm. If they want to. And then, you know, the second one is don't steal from them. So, of course, we know that every animal that is raised for food or that is used in in any exploitive way, uh, we steal from them. We steal their lives. We steal the sunshine from them, Mm -hmm. lock them in a cage in a dark room or, yeah. I mean, it goes, I mean, I don't. Their Your baby. audience knows this. You yeah. Have babies and... Yeah, their milk, their eggs, everything. And tell the truth. You know, be truthful. Mm. Yeah, that is, that is certainly linked with veganism because the, <laughs> the meat and dairy industries don't want us to know the truth. And so deception is a very uh, integral part yeah. of the culture of, um, of being mean. That it says it's okay right. to um, do these these horrific, cruel things to other people. Mm-hmm. And animals are people. They're people like us. They have 
souls, thoughts, ambitions, they have their own agendas. Mm -hmm. But we've enslaved them. So we live in a slave culture, basically, mm -hmm. that says that certain people are the privileged ones and others are not. And others are there to, for us, for the privileged ones. Well, I mean, when you wake up and you realize, what? I don't think that's true. Mm -hmm. Just right. based on what they look like, really, when you think about yes, it. Yes, yes. Because there's some animals in our society that we love, that we adore, that we have sleep in our bed with us, our cats, our dogs. Our bunnies, sometimes hamsters, <laughs> so mice, rats, <laughs> snakes. I, yeah, people have have them as companion animals, and so it just kind of goes to show from the moment you're born the deep social conditioning that we're taught that just simply based on the way they they look, pigs, cows, chickens, turkeys, fish that these animals are for food, that these animals uh, that we have as companion animals are are here as our pets is what people say, you know. So it's and we we are conditioned by those lies and those lies go against yoga meaning that they tell us that everyone is separate yeah and the truth is we're all intertwined mm -hmm. that we're all one connected being Really, it's really beautiful, and I think that if we started to see that more, it would be a lot harder for us to hurt animals. And the only way is through love. You know, unconditional love, not looking at someone, and the first thing you think of is how can they further my agenda? Mm -hmm. What can they do for me? Right. And that's how we've been able to rationalize the abuse of animals. In fact, people even argue. Well, they're put on this earth for us to use. That's right. their purpose. And it doesn't just go uh, uh, that far. It goes with, you know, we, we become friends with somebody because we think that person can mm -hmm. further our cause, right? right? Or do things for us, provide for us. So most of our relationships really are based on that, looking at someone else and thinking how can... I best use them. Mm. So yoga questions that. So there's, if you see others, don't hurt them, don't lie to them, don't steal from them. Mm. And the fourth one, and this kind of stumped me when I had the six days to write the book, how do I bring this into veganism? This has got to be the sex one. It is. <laughs> I, <know. laughs> I love this one. You take, take it, it away. Take it, take it. You know, uh, it's 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 called brahmacharya. Okay, that's the word I was looking for. Brahmacharya, and sexually it assaulting. Means, it means don't abuse. If you're still seeing others and not God, and not your own self, then make sure you don't abuse them sexually. Yeah, I mean that seems like common sense, right? Common sense is not so common, Jamie. It clearly is not because I'm like, it just, things like this wouldn't even occur to me to want to sexually assault someone, yet this happens daily to millions of people, animals. Billions. Billions, yeah. Maybe trillions. Absolutely. We were just doing a podcast the other day and we were talking about dogs and, and French bulldogs and breeding and just the extreme lengths that people go to like jerk them off. And I mean, it's, it's just like, what have we come to as a humane species? Yeah. And then we get all up in arms when uh, about child abuse, you know, like yeah. human child abuse. Right. And well, what about all the children, the goat children, the lambs, mm. the calves, the chicks, that every child, I mean, I mean, wouldn't we think that that would have an effect on how we are also interacting with yeah. other human beings? It permeates our atmosphere. It is what drives the animal user industries, mm -hmm. sexual abuse, rape. Yeah. 
we wouldn't have the animal user industries, the meat and dairy industries, if rape was not business as usual. Come on, you know, it's called animal husbandry. That is creepy. Uh, yeah. I mean, and that's what it used to be called, animal husbandry. That's rape creepy. racks in the dairy industry where they artificially inseminate the cow. That's rape. And that's what the industry standard term is. Yeah, this is ugly. Mm -hmm. It's ugly. And Patanjali also says, if you don't engage in that, here's the upside. You will enjoy vitality. Mm. You will have a char charismatic personality, even, he says. I mean, look at you. Look at you. <laughs> <laughs> you are truly one of the most charismatic people I've ever met. And um, and a vegan, and okay. I got my issues, but we try. <laughs> I, I could be better in a lot of ways, but I think that's the, the point, is that we're ever learning, and, and that's why I, I do well, let's really, hope so. Absolutely, always, right? Once you do know, you do better. And, I mean, Ingrid Newkirk says... In these times that we live, ignorance is really no excuse. Mm -hmm. and Absolutely. I'm, I'm on her side with that. Completely agree. Because, I mean, like I said, when I saw that movie in 1982, it was the first movie. that I mean, it was like, wow. But now there's so many sources. There's yeah. so many books. There's so many podcasts. There's so mm -hmm. many movies. And uh, you can't. You can't uh, uh, pretend that you don't know these days. Yeah. No one can pretend they don't know what's going on to animals. Absolutely. And what was the fifth yama? The fifth is called aparigraha. Okay. And aparigraha means not to be greedy. Mm. So that, that took a lot of uh, deep contemplation and meditation for the... Mm, the writing to appear to me mm -hmm. in my six days. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> that was probably the hardest one for me. But then, and it was the last one to kind of come to me, like what does this have to do with veganism? And, oh. but it, it did come, um, thank God. And parikraha means don't be greedy. So if you see others, don't, be so greedy that you impoverish them. Mm -hmm. And of course, that is what we are doing with this whole planet. Our greed, our blind selfishness, taking, 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 and never thinking of the consequences for others. Mm -hmm. Thinking that... It's our right to do that. Um, so, of course, that has everything to do with veganism. Mm -hmm. and, and just because somebody enjoys the taste pleasure from eating an animal doesn't justify taking their entire existence away for, you know, a meal that lasts 30 minutes. It, you know, it's... Or taking... <laughs> causing the extinction of... I mean, it's not just that animal that you ate that is no more, yeah. but this all species on this planet, yeah. the wild species, mm -hmm. the water, the air, the land, the everything, you know, it, it affects Everything we do affects everything else. Mm -hmm. And if we want to relate it to factory farms, for example, you can look at how animal agriculture is destroying rainforests, you know, clearing the rainforest for cattle grazing to actually grow crops to feed the animals. Over 70%, you know, of soy production is caused because of to feed farmed animals. And then you look at the ocean dead zones, pollution, all sorts of environmental damages. So it extends to so much more. And I find it super interesting how you took these yamas and then you related it to an important cause that you care, cared about. So what's confusing to me is how you have these really brilliant people, these very spiritual people that are connected, you know, or feel that they are connected, but don't understand veganism and they're not vegan. How do you 
feel about that. It's confusing for it's me. Crazy. It's a crazy world. Yeah. I, I can only <laughs> do... Uh, I mean, you cannot force another person yeah. to eat a veggie burger. You know, I mean, you can try. I try. You can. <laughs> yeah. But what other people do, they're going to do it. And when you try to fight with reality, you're going to lose. Mm-hmm. You're going to lose. So you have to be, Jamie, we have to be very, very sneaky. Are okay. you ready? Yes. Just telling people the facts, okay, maybe some people will get it. Like, when I saw that movie, I got it, and mm-hmm. it changed my life. But that's not going to work for everybody. Yeah. I. Th- you want to know what I think? Please. Okay. I've written a book. I've written many books about the subject, but who reads books these days? I read your books. Okay. Good. Great. <laughs> but you're a minority, Okay. <laughs> What are people really, I mean, they, they watch movies, they watch TV shows, mm-hmm. they, they watch podcasts, yeah. they watch things on their devices. I, th- this is just my personal opinion, yeah. the next big step in the vegan movement, in the animal rights movement, in animal and environmental activism is to have characters in TV and move in feature films and movie shows series who are vegan who are activists so that and they're not depicted though in a derogatory way which is what is happening now like a yoga person you know in a sitcom is like <laughs> you know, mm. not taken seriously. Right. The teenager who is like, no, mom, I'm not eating that now. Mm. I'm eating this instead. Mm. I'm a vegan, you know. And it's, everybody laughs, and it's like uh, they're the... Uh, the joke. The joke, the joke. Yeah. And so, but you see, we're a species who imitates. Mm. So we can use that for our cause. So, and even in in the Bhagavad Gita, it is said that people follow the example of a great person. Mm. Like a great person, someone who is known, who is liked, who is popular. What they do Mm -hmm. will be followed. So people learn how to interact with other people and with the world and with animals they learn it from watching TV. Okay. This is just a fact. Come on. It, mm-hmm. it, it is. For, uh, TV meaning like, you know, all forms of like media like that. Yeah. And so when we start seeing on the screen like a family sit down to dinner and it just happens to be totally vegan, but not a big deal is made of it. Just like you see films now when the family gets together and it's Thanksgiving and there's a turkey on the table. No one says, oh, there's a turkey on the table and we're going to eat this turkey because we like to eat turkey. No, it's sort of just there. what happens. Mm -hmm. It it creates a status quo. Exactly. So many years ago when Starbucks was going to wanting to uh, uh, create coffee shops in New York City. One of the first ones that opened was right next to the Jiva Mukti Yoga Center. Mm. And so they did not have soy milk or oat milk or any of those Mm. options at that time. And I woke up that morning. I saw the words. <laughs> I had the idea. No, yeah, truly. I know. That's what happened. I just come. I need to try. I wish this happened to me. This was the first day they opened. I went across the street. There was a bodega. Mm-hmm. They had soy milk. I bought a, a box of the soy milk. I went over to the Starbucks. A young, you know, guy comes up. What would you like? I said, I'll have a soy cappuccino, please. He says, oh, w- wait, what? I said, a, a soy cappuccino. And I was kind of being, trying to be like you. 
all <laughs> cute and smiles and happy and cheerful and, you know, positive. And like the guy said, I, I don't know what you're saying. And I said, a cappuccino. And he goes, yeah, I know that. And, and I, said, I said, with soy milk. And he goes, soy milk? Like, what's that? Oh you know, gosh. so I said, oh, um, you know, we just have regular milk. I said, well, this is regular. It's soybeans are regular. And I said, can you make me one? And then here's, I brought my own soy milk. Mm. So wow. he goes, I don't know if I can do that. And I'm like, no, it'll foam up. It'll be like, you know, and he kind of like liked me and I kind of yeah. liked him. We had a, we were laughing and we were like, you know, talking about other things. And so he goes, okay, you know, he made it. He goes, wow. And I said, did you taste, you know, make one for yourself. And he goes, well, I can't have one right now. You know, and I said like, he goes, here's your soy milk back. I said, well, why don't you keep it? Maybe someone else will come and ask for soy milk cappuccino. He goes, I don't think so. (laughs) And I, well, maybe you'll try it. You know, and he goes, okay. So anyway, I went back to the yoga center. And there was some students there, and I said, who wants to be part of a project with me? I said, okay, well, you're going to go over to Starbucks, and you're going to ask for, you know, like, okay. So I said, let's stagger yourself so not everybody goes at once, you know. But I said, the main thing is That's brilliant. you have to be friendly. Don't go in there with a thought of course they're not going to have it. Of course they're not vegan. Of course they're just part of the, uh, you know, meat matrix system. You know, oh, mm-hmm. you know, no. Be the change you want to see. Envision a Starbucks that has soy milk already and mm-hmm. believe it. Yeah, I need to start envisioning that they stop upcharging for it now. Well, let's not even go there. <laughs> Let, let's just start. Okay, num- the first step was just, I got to get it. I got to get a plant-based milk into this, you know, multinational I'm coffee like, shop. Be the change, be the change, be the change. Yeah. Okay. And, and so, and like, you know, like how an actor approaches a part, you have to believe in the character. You have to believe in the story. Yeah. You're part of the narrative for it to come true. Mm. So... I kind of gave a little briefing to my my students, my friends who were going to be on this, do this project, and within three weeks there was soy milk on the menu. Wow! Now, I don't know if it was us. It I, was I, you for no, sure. No, no, no. I don't know that. Oh. It could have been from top down. It could have been other factors. But what I'm saying is, it showed how this. The idea was just make it as if it's a normal thing. Mm -hmm. Don't present it as if it's this, although it is a radical and a, you know, the way that it should be, et cetera, et cetera. But because if, because then you come at your so-called opposition as if they're your opponent and they're adversary Mm -hmm. and you're fighting an adversary and then it's just, it's, it's a fight. Right. Love will conquer all. Mm-hmm. So if you truly, you know, and another thing that Ingrid Newkirk has inspired me, she goes, you know, never be afraid of confronting, you know, others that don't believe in it. And, and, and how you can not be afraid is because remember, you are kind. Mm. This is a campaign for kindness. Mm -hmm. And kindness is not radical. (laughs) Kindness is our true nature. Yes. But we have to present it in a radical way. (laughs) (laughs) Tell us about it. We were just in Grand Central half naked with some like tubes hanging out of our boobs. (laughs) But it is, if you believe it is our true nature, you know, that we are kind beings. And when you are kind to others, you awaken their kindness. Yeah. And yeah, I love that so much. And it's kind of a magic. It's a magic. It's casting a spell. Mm-hmm. It's like a shift in perception. Yeah. And that's what magic is. When you shift your perception of how you see something or someone or possibilities, mm-hmm. 
and it widens, it expands. Would you say that yoga is kind of a tool to be able to do that? Because yes. I think a lot of people, <laughs> you're like, yeah, that's kind of my whole thing. Um, but, <laughs> but because I feel like a lot of people, at least in my generation or my friends, you know, when I say let's go to a yoga class, they think of it as a workout or they just think of it as that physical stretch and, you know, the positions, as you were saying in the beginning of this episode. So with yoga, I guess what challenges have you had to maybe push through or overcome uh, in, in, in yoga personally? Teaching yoga according to the scriptures. Mm. But Danjali says, oh, this is like one of my favorite scriptures, um, Vastu Samye Chitta Bedat Tayor Vibhaktaha Pantaha. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you cool. know yeah of course yeah. Oh, I see it on the wall and I wake up <laughs> but what it means is each individual person sees the same thing in a different way mm-hmm. according to their own state of mind and projections mm. everything is empty from its own side and appears according to how we see it so you're absolutely spot on when you say if you tell somebody, let's go to a yoga class together, they think of it as a workout. Mm-hmm. That's what they're projecting onto it. Right. It can be whatever you want it to be. Mm. Starbucks can be whatever you want it to be. Mm-hmm. You know, um, This other person that you think is your enemy, well, could you think that they're not your enemy? Do you have, yeah. you know, do you have room in your heart, in your mind, to widen your perception? And just, you know, it's kind of like quantum physics. It's like, can you see multiple possibilities? Then life becomes fun, Mm -hmm. truly fun. Because you're not, it's nothing is really set in stone, really. It's like, believe, you know, (laughs) like it sounds kind of new agey, Uh, you know, believe and it happens. Right. You know? <laughs> right. Well, I love how you just said nothing is set in stone. It's so true. Like we are not set in stone. Yeah. We're just particles together. It's just frequencies. It's Hardly vibrations. Together, we're like kind of like mm. bouncing we're, we're one. Back and forth all yeah. the time. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> it's so wild. And and this is like a I mean, you know, for me, I think back before I went vegan, because I think veganism actually helped m- me open my eyes to spiritual practices. Mm-hmm. I don't I think before that I was just very closed off and very caught up in normal everyday society and I love how you talked about movies and using movies and media to get this message across because that's what could have awoken somebody like me sooner I think being in seeing these concepts more status quo more normalized is so so important um and so I've never actually heard that perspective so that's but I think it's the next big step for us as vegan activists okay we've come this far and that's far but where are we going to take it from here? Keep splashing those images, you know, in people's faces of, you know, the cruelty, the horrible, what goes on behind closed doors. Okay, that does have an effect. I mean, we, we show tons of movies in our teacher training course, our yoga teacher training course, mm-hmm. and really we have a 99% after that course they're vegan for life. They're not only vegan for life, but they are activists. Mm. So it does have an effect. Yes, definitely. But I really think that the next big step is to normalize it, to put it in our mainstream as if it's like everybody's doing it. What? What, what do you mean? It's it's not weird. I mean, that's this uh, this past year. You know, we have to rent venues to teach our our Jiva Mukti teacher training. And there's a place in India that we've been going to for years, and they want to charge us extra for the soy milk in, for oh. the meals. And so we use this as an opportunity. Like, no, it has to be normalized. It has to be, there's no extra that it's like, we're different. No. You know, this is what you This is what you present as part of your menu. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. And they and and they went along with it this year. Yes. Yes. Definitely want to take one of those teacher trainings. I was just talking to Giacco about this. Like this is a goal of mine, you know, eventually to do a yoga teacher training. And I think 
that kind of leads us into the next part is as activists, how do you feel that taking care of ourselves will help us advocate more? Well, you know, be the change you want to see. I mean, it's like, um, <laughs> yoga is not really about taking care of yourself. I, I don't see it that way. Uh, interesting. I guess it's not something I do for myself. It's something I do for myself with a capital S for God. Yes. Okay. God will take care of, God will make things happen. See, this is, I'm an inst- I want to be an instrument for that goodness. Mm. So I have to be open to that, to be able to be an instrument, right? right. I have to be tuned to that. Right. Because that's how an instrument is able to play <laughs> good music, right? They're in tune. So wow. that's my job as an instrument to stay in tune. And um, when I feel I'm out of tune, it's when I feel like I'm being mm, selfish. I'm making decisions that are based on my... Uh, my ego uh, uh, gratification, you know, what, what's good for me right now? You know, what do I want? Uh, and if we start thinking, well, what would God want? God meaning like, what would be mutually beneficial for everyone? Mm-hmm. Then it just kind of comes natural that um, you do things that would enhance the lives of others. Right. Just... You don't have to, it's not a chore anymore to be kind yeah. because you know that every act of kindness will come back to you. I mean, everything you do comes back to you. Right. So uh, being unkind comes back to you too, you know? I mean, mm-hmm. being cruel comes back to you. Yeah. Uh, being harsh, being insensitive. Uh, it'll, we're so important. Our actions are so important. Mm. And, you know, we've been, we've all been indoctrinated to thinking that um, it's nice to be kind to others, that it only benefits them. But yoga teaches that, no, that's the way that we, we benefit ultimately. Mm. Um, it's a win-win. Yeah. So you're investing in your own future mm. by being kind to others now. So what is yoga? Yoga is this. And for those listening, it was just a join, joining of the hands. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yoga. I like that. Yoga is a Sanskrit word. It means to join. To join. To join. And it means to join with God. Mm. Mm-hmm. Join or connect or remember. I like that. English word oh. best remember so you renew your membership basically yeah you remember you make a mem- you make yourself a member again of the love club the mm. kindness club the happiness club the satchitananda club mm. which is another way of describing the god club i guess you know like i mean i know god is a buzzword and a lot of people don't believe in god and they think they're atheists and Okay, well, whatever word you want to use that is something bigger than your own ego, your own selfish personality, your own uh, 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 mortal, you know, body-mind being. Like John Robbins, um, one time he gave this wonderful lecture at the Jumuti Yoga School. And he said some brilliant things. And I remember him saying, we are more than our skin encapsulated ego. Hmm. Well, yoga is about, for me, finding out what that more is. You know, Hmm. how to be more than my body and mind, my personality, my skin encapsulated ego. Yeah, kindness, love, God. That's that's what how I view God. Mm-hmm. that's really beautiful and yeah I think you, you said that really perfectly like whatever that higher power is for people being able to see outside of yourself and to trust the universe in a lot of different ways and I mean we don't really know what happens after we die everybody has sorts of beliefs I would like to think that if that we go to a place where it's 
nice and peaceful. I don't know. And I just know that where I am now is in the present and that every day my actions just by what I eat can be making kinder choices. Uh, and that's, that's, that's really important. But yeah, I think that there's this misconception that like we go vegan for ourselves and, and we don't. I don't go vegan for myself at all, at, at all, actually. It's only, I mean. What do you mean by that? I think a lot of people think that it's about health. And, yeah, yeah. and that, yeah, that it's just like you go vegan because it'll make you skinnier or that because it, it will give you more energy, which, I mean, it can, depending on how you eat. You could eat french fries all day or you could eat, you know, smoothies and salads. But uh, I went vegan because I didn't want to be the reason why animals suffered. And I find it really interesting because I don't know why I connected to this and so many people don't. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really make so much sense to me because, you know, I feel like I grew up very like in, in very normal society with people that I was surrounded by that all ate animals. I don't know what that light bulb was. I feel the same. I'm like a stranger in a strange land. Kind of that's that? how I felt for a long time. Yeah. yeah. Then I met you. Yes. Uh, I'm like, these are my people. I have a friend. <laughs> I'll be your friend, Sharon. <laughs> People's perception of yoga or veganism um, who aren't yoga practitioners who aren't vegan. Yeah. yeah. You know, uh, you know Matthew Scully, brilliant man who wrote Dominion. Yeah. So when his book came out, Dominion, a friend of mine, uh, a fellow, uh, not fellow, I see that's not right gender to say, a, a sister <laughs> vegan, <laughs> uh, another vegan friend yeah. of mine um, told me about the book. She read a, a review in the New York Times and, and I was like, what? This guy is the senior speechwriter for President Bush at the time and he wrote this book? So I read the book, and then I was like, I have to meet him. This, I have to meet this person. So I called up some of my friends, like uh, actually Gene Bauer from yeah. Farm Sanctuary, and I said, Gene, do you, do you have any way, do you know how to get in touch with this guy? Have you read the book? Oh, yeah, I read the book. Isn't it brilliant? Yes, yes, yes. So anyway, Gene had a, had a phone number or something. So I'm like, called him up, and I said, uh, 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 I want to meet you. He goes, oh, who are you? And I'm like, well, I'm, you know. And so anyway, we went to Washington, D.C. And um, <laughs> to meet him. And uh, it was right before President Bush announced the war. You yeah. know, it was you know, after 9-11. And to cut a long and, and really amazing story a little bit short, David and I ended up and also my sister April was with me because she lives near D.C. We ended up in Matthew Scully's house in Arlington with his wife, Emmanuel, uh, having breakfast together one Sunday morning. And so we arrive, and we sit down, and he says, the first thing he says to me is, so... I find it really strange that you're a yoga teacher and you have a yoga school and you're a vegan and animal rights. That doesn't like go together. And, and so I started laughing and, and, and I said, Matthew Scully, you are the senior speechwriter for the president of the United States and you have written this brilliant book about veganism and animal rights. And uh, uh, <laughs> how does that like again? <laughs> That's so confusing. <laughs> and so he laughed, and so we both were laughing, and um, and we hit it off, and yeah. you know, then we had this wonderful, wonderful time together. But and then she's it, like, "I made him go into down dog. He was doing shavasana <laughs> by the end." Of it. But but it's just this this um, you know misperception. Yeah. That's all. Yeah. And and that's what all prejudices stem from, a misperception. And misperceptions really stem from lack of respect. The word respect means to look and to look again. Mm -hmm. It comes from a Latin root. And so I think in our, in our movement, veganism, respect is essential. To look, and it really implies looking deep 
deeply into things. And so when people do look more deeply into yoga, then they can see that it's not just about a workout, unless they want it to be just right. about a workout, you know. That veganism is not just about health, unless they want it to be just about health, but it could be so much more. Mm -hmm. That's really beautiful. I mean, we've covered so many things today and I'm so thankful for you, like just sharing your story and how you've got to where you are because you're a huge inspiration to me and I'm inspired to kind of set out on my path to learning more and, and hopefully being able to be a better instrument and serve others. Uh, more than I can, more than I do now, uh, because I, I think that it's really important. I, I went through a tough journey with activism. Like I really was so frustrated and I get that that's why vegans can get so angry because it's like we're seeing all these horrible things happen to defenseless animals. And then we are seeing our loved ones participate in that. And then we just are like, why the hell are you doing that? You know, we get angry and mad. And, and so I get it. And there's all these intense emotions and there's infighting. But if we're able to kind of t take a step back and be like, well, we're practicing this because we, we want to be kind. We want to spread love. We have to make sure that we're doing that consistently. Compassion. Yeah. Compassion is, is different than empathy, different than sympathy, different than pity. Compassion is when you see the suffering of another or see the potential, like you, you know, your family or your friends who aren't vegan, and you see, you know, in your mind, yeah. the whole process of their future, and that they're going to end up not happy, you know, and they're going to maybe in a in a if you believe in future lives, they're going to be an animal in a factory farm, and so you see that, and but instead of being angry or frustrated. If you can pull up the innate compassion within you, and compassion allows us to recognize the suffering in another, to feel it as our own, but then to figure out how to do something about it so both of us mm -hmm. are uplifted out of the suffering. And is there a place that you would recommend somebody start or begin, whether it's a book, a class somebody could take, a podcast to listen to? Because it, there's so many different paths to take, I feel like. People will do what they're going to do. Yeah. I mean, you know, you, me, I mean, I write books. You talk to people on your podcast and your, your different platforms. You can only do what you do. And... Let's see what happens. It's exciting. Is there a daily practice that you would recommend? Whether <laughs> I know you said you meditated this morning. What I do, yes. I do lots of things. But they might not work for everybody, you know. And I'm not a proselytizer. Of, I am like, I feel if people are interested, they'll come to me and they'll ask. So you've come to me and, and you've asked. So I could tell you. But I don't know if everybody out there, if it might work for them or if they're really interested. So mm, let's wait and see. I'll talk to you about it. And then maybe you can talk uh, to others if they ask you. But um, okay. Some, yes. I asked somebody what their daily routines once was. And he was like, oh, I just jump into an ice cold freezing shower at 6 in the morning. I was like... Oh my God. <laughs> That's not for me. That's not. <laughs> I mean, thank you so much. Was there anything else that you wanted to share before we wrap things up that we didn't get to cover in this hour? I think you are doing an absolutely great, great job. Thank you. And I feel so honored to be here with you. And I met your partner, Justina, and you both are a dynamic duo. And um, wow, world, watch out. And where can people connect and find you if they wanted to learn more? You go on Amazon, and and um, uh, I've written uh, fourteen books. <laughs> and um, although, uh, <laughs> yes, um, and there's JivaMuktiYoga.com, the mm -hmm. and uh, that's a wonderful resource. 
place for many things vegan and um, yoga and exciting things that are happening all over the world. There are Jumukti schools in, oh my go goodness, uh, Germany, England, France, Australia, India, Luxembourg, uh, Barcelona, uh, New York City. Which is what uh, I go to. Yes. Okay. So, and veganism is one of our foundation tenets. Yes. Well, thank you for all you do, all that you're creating. And um, it's really an honor to meet you and to be able to do this podcast. So guys, you know where to find me. I'm at It's Jamie's Corner. Please check out Sharon Gannon and some of her books. I definitely have learned a lot from this. So until next time, I will see you around. Bye. Bye. Woo! <laughs>